Brussels Report podcast. Welcome to a new episode of the uh, Brussels Report uh, podcast. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kleppe. I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, BrusselsReport.eu. And I'm very happy to have as my guest uh, today, uh, Martin uh, Kinnunen, who is the um, uh, climate and environment spokesman of the Swedish uh, Democrats, the Sweden Democrats. He's a member of the Swedish Parliament, also a member of the EU Affairs Committee in the in the Swedish Parliament. Uh, so very welcome, Martin. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, it's very timely because, um, as I think my listeners know, uh, Sweden is currently chairing the uh, the the EU um, Council, eh? so the, the the body where the member states of the European Union get together uh, to decide all kinds of uh, important um, legislation. Uh, so perhaps first we can start with the topic of uh, of energy uh, independence. I mean, looking back at at the last year. Uh, we we could see that this was clearly um, a big challenge for the European Union. Specifically, Germany had become way too dependent on, on Russia for its energy provision. So, so looking back, uh, do you think we have made uh, progress on this? Yeah, we have made some progress in a short period of time. Uh, we're not as dependent on Russian energy anymore. And I'm a bit surprised. It, it was fast anyway, but... Uh, Everything is more expensive these days, so it has been costly, one must say. Uh, quite. Uh, I mean, we're uh, importing, at least Europe, I'm not sure about Sweden, is importing a lot of American LNG gas, uh, freedom gas, as Trump uh, used yeah. to call it. But of course, uh, this is at 10 times the price yeah. of, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the price of gas before uh, before the war. And it's also weird because um, the kind of gas uh, that we are importing from the states um, is produced th- through uh, shaling, and and uh, this is a, a banned in Europe. Yeah. So, so isn't it ironic? Yeah, of course it's it's ironic, and and we produce less and less uh, gas in Europe every year, uh, and still need it. And in in Sweden, we're not uh, at all dependent on gas, but. When electricity becomes more costly in in Germany, for example, it becomes much more costly in Sweden as well. So energy policies uh, were a really big issue in the Swedish elections last fall. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so specifically, uh, the Swedish presidency, um, you know, what what are the the concrete uh, topics uh, that, um, you know, the Swedish presidency is is pushing in order to, you know, uh, um, deliver more energy independence? Yeah, I would say that the Swedish presidency is a bit afraid of what the commission is going to propose uh, regarding the uh, energy area. Uh, we don't want uh, a lot more regulation and we can't just make the price become cheaper. Uh, you, have, you have to uh, deliver more energy. And in, in Sweden, uh, the, our party and the government are on the same track. We need more nuclear power in Sweden. Uh, and I know the presidency also trying to uh, talk a bit, bit about nuclear uh, on the EU level. It's difficult because we have these countries that are really afraid of nuclear. Mm. Uh, but it's uh, on the agenda. Uh, but I'm, I'm not that hopeful that, that we're going to see much progress uh, regarding nuclear. Yeah, uh, and and this is weird because um, in in theory, the European Union is bound by the Euratom Treaty. uh, And I looked it up uh, this week and and it basically mentions that the signatories to the Euratom Treaty are obliged to promote uh, and support, um, you know, nuclear power as an energy source. Uh, So so, um, it's it's weird that this does not often uh, come up. And also, if you look in the debate where if you care a lot about uh, CO2 emission and you don't want to have degrowth, you don't want to, you know, uh, reduce living standards, um, then there's actually not not much choice. Then nuclear power needs to you know, needs to be there. Definitely. And uh, we can't just use uh, more wind and solar power. And we see how it becomes more and more difficult to, to deliver more uh, wind farms. Uh, we have already built them on the best places already, mm. and so it's uh, it's not it, 
it's one solution, but it's not the only solution. And we need more solutions on, on the energy issues. Uh, so, of course, we need nuclear. And it's really depressing that we have all these German-speaking countries that really, uh, really hate, uh, <laughs> hate uh, nuclear in, in Europe. Yes, it's almost a religion. And, and at the same time, while, um, you know, uh, uh, Europe is uh, suffering from a, an energy shortage, and while some countries like Spain and Portugal are pushing to like reduce market um, uh, dynamism in the energy market, um, you know we, we see that the European Union is coming up with its uh, its green green deal um, and and basically is uh, is uh, imposing higher uh, percentages uh, or targets uh, for renewable what it what it is calling renewable energy. Um, uh, and at the same time is uh, po- imposing um, uh, an expansion of the, the ETS um, obligation, so basically the emission trading system to expand this to more sectors, which is effectively some kind of a climate tax that customers should pay, which is, uh, I mean, um, do, do you find uh, your, your party that uh, maybe at, at this point in, in history, surely it should be easier to convince people when we have massive energy shortages that perhaps imposing even higher taxes on energy may not be the, the best idea ever. Um, no, of course, uh, the only solution to, to the energy crisis is more energy, of mm. course. And, uh, but at the same time, ETS is, is not a bad instrument, but mm. you have to have the right level. Uh, of course, it's these days, uh, I believe the price is 100 euros. Mm. And the rest of the world pays zero to ten, perhaps. Of yes. course, it's going to affect uh, the economic growth mm. in Europe. Uh, so there are, I mean, there are good ambitions in the new Green Deal, uh, but uh, the timeline is flawed and uh, it's uh, too much, too fast, uh, and that is worrisome. Uh, at the same time, as a Swede, we have really high national climate targets. In some ways, the Europeans are less bad, uh, but at the same time, I mean, the effort sharing regulation for for Sweden, I I don't think we are going to succeed in reaching it. It's going to be really, really difficult and probably very, very costly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Sweden made a terrible deal on the effort sharing regulation. So 2030, we have to have like 50% less emissions in the the highest of all the countries, so it's going to be really, really tough. And I know uh, today the politicians from the dif- from the other parties they are starting to realize perhaps that wasn't a really good deal. <laughs> we should uh, have said something earlier. And now it's too late because it's uh, I mean it's a, it's a done deal now. Okay, and there's no way to start to unwind it now, or I think it will be very, very difficult. Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, we have. Many parts of, of the Green Deal is uh, the negotiations are uh, they, they are done, uh, and it's uh, difficult to, to come in this late in the, in the process of the change very much, and it's uh, going to be problematic for Sweden. And we have the forestry sector as well that is very affected by the LULUCF regulation. It's going to be very hard to have growth in, in the forest sector. Uh, the coming years and it's going to be very costly for sweden mm. okay and um related to that you mentioned that um in europe we have the um uh, the ets so the climate tax uh, that is now uh, at record level high uh, around 100 euro um and and this is not the case in the rest of the world where they don't do these things um so in response the european union is coming up with a thing called cbam uh, which is um, an external climate tariff. So the logic is that, oh, first we tax our own industry, uh, and this is then uh, seen as very unfair for them because they can't compete with the rest of the world. So in the bureaucratic logic, um, we need then um, a compensating measure. Yeah. Uh, we need to impose tariffs on Im- imports, we'll, which will, of course, be once again, at the end of the day, be paid by ordinary people, by the end uh, consumer. So, so is the Swedish presidency uh, and, and your, your party making efforts to, um, you know, to counter that? Yeah. In some way, you you have bad proposals, and then you need 
other regulations to tackle them. Yeah. And perhaps CBM as a principle is not that bad, but we see large problems for a lot of switch companies because they are selling their products to countries outside of Europe. Mm. And now they want uh, cash uh, funding to, to be able to keep doing this. Uh, so perhaps uh, if you only sell to other European countries, you're it's okay. But if you export outside the union, it's going to be very problematic, uh, I believe, to, uh, to be able to... Uh, keep doing business. So it's going to be problematic. And I'm not sure that it will survive the negotiations in the World Trade Organization. Also, and and yeah. what will the answer be from US and China and South America? So it's uh, a lot of questions on how to implement this, uh, really, I, I believe. Yeah, and also seems a bit of a weird timing when the European Union claims to be the only one standing up for global trade and against uh, decoupling. Uh, it's coming up with measures that uh, directly go against the, the logic of, uh, of the World Trade Organization. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and even if it does not uh, violate technically the WTO rules, uh, I could imagine that this is not going to help Europe to open up trade more, you know, if, if it uh, treats its trading partners like that, if suddenly Indian yeah. uh, steel imports are subject to uh, uh, higher tariffs. Yeah. Um, ultimately based on our own choices to, you know, uh, deal with uh, climate change. Um, I don't think India will be particularly interested in a, a trade deal. No, pr um, probably not. And, and we have this extreme uh, climate policies and, they, and then we need to have extreme <laughs> other policies yeah. as well to, to keep our businesses in Europe. And uh, it's going to be very problematic. Hopefully everyone, everyone will realize that we have to uh, change some stuff here uh, but uh, who knows when uh, we have probably we need a new commission mm. so it won't happen during this term five year yeah. term so let's see what happened after the next uh, European elections perhaps we could see a new commission with some new ideas and, and yes. more constructive uh, dialogues with the member countries as well yeah because this kind of uh, doubts that we're expressing if you um you know, if, if you if you raise them in the policy bubble in Brussels, then um, most people are not very open to it. Whereas I would say that this is is very much common sense, and yeah. uh, I would say in in the in the general public debate, most people would be at least if you look at opinion polls, um, most people are, for example, very friendly to nuclear power. Yeah. Um, even in Germany, uh, many people that vote for the Greens, uh, also in France, eh, where also uh, nuclear plants have been shut down, perfectly functional nuclear yeah. plants. Even France went along with this uh, anti-nuclear mentality. Uh, I saw an opinion poll that the majority of the Green Party voters in France are fans of nuclear power. I think in Finland, the Greens are officially in favor of nuclear under certain conditions, of course. Uh, so, so I'm just wondering: Are we not um, are are we not taking decisions in the same way that Germany was conducting energy yeah. five years ago? That we know we're, we're this is this will be reversed. Yeah, I, I think everybody is starting to wake up, and mm. we had the same problem in Sweden during the last twenty years. We have closed down like four reactors, mm. and now uh, we have a majority in the parliament to, to build new ones and change the laws and make it uh, simple make it happen with more uh, power, uh, nuclear power plants. So it's starting to happen. It, it, it's too late, but I believe it's going to happen. And, and I believe Germany also will, will change their minds eventually. And the process is, is there at least. So I believe it will get better, but it has <laughs> taken too, too, too long time. Yes, yes. Maybe uh, one, one specific topic I want to discuss, which I find very telling for this whole debate, is the, um, the proposed European union ban on uh, the combustion engine <laughs> yeah. which has been invented in europe by uh, daimler if i'm not mistaken um, i mean it's a strength of european industry so i think even if you're uh, in favor of protectionism i'm definitely not then even then it's not a good idea to ban the combustion engine yeah. uh, and still we see um, a majority of the european parliament voting to ban this why are they banning this technology because they apparently have um, knowledge 
to predict that uh, electric vehicles and and other technologies will uh, progress so fast that they will be able to take over uh, and convince cos- uh, consumers, uh, which to me seems like something of an enormous hubris. You know, um, also if you look at uh, the lesson from the last year, we have become way too dependent on on Russia. I mean, and and we all know how strong China is when it comes to electric vehicles or specifically batteries. I mean, so how, how is it possible that a majority of MEPs are, are voting for this? And, and also, how is it possible that member states are very supportive of this, even if the last news is that, thankfully, Germany and Italy are finally waking up and, and are having second thoughts about it? Yeah, uh, uh, I've heard that this is, there are some discussions in the council, and the last thing I heard was that it is not going to be a decision uh, mm-hmm. eight, 8 of March. Will be later on. Okay. Uh, so let's see what happened there. Uh, in Sweden, uh, the old parliament uh, uh, during the last term, uh, they had a decision to ban it by 2030. So I was quite. Uh, uh, it, it was a lot better with the Commission's <laughs> proposal to ban it uh, by 2035. Uh, so, but. Really, I believe the market will fix this by themselves. Uh, I don't mm. think people, uh, the majority of people, won't buy an uh, electric uh, fossil fuel car in, in Sweden uh, in 10 years. I don't think so. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, we have uh, some countries in Europe uh, with uh, a lot of problems with the infrastructure and the grid. And uh, who is going to pay for this? Uh, when they are not succeeding by themselves, probably it will be EU funding here as well. So as a Swede, we will first build our own uh, uh, grid in Sweden, and then we we'll ha- have to pay for for it in Poland and Romania and Bulgaria and, and all these countries. So uh, I, I think it would be better to to let the market handle this, and I think that the fossil fuel cars uh, are on their way out, and it's not the politicians. Uh, Politicians shouldn't uh, try to look into the future and know when people need uh, the diesel cars and, and when they don't. It's a bad proposal from the Commission, and let, let's see what's happened in the Council now. Okay, okay. Well, good. Um, and then maybe one more topic is is the uh, American um, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. It's, it's a yeah. bit a strange name for <laughs> legislation that is uh, showering industry with uh, subsidies and tax breaks. Uh, This is not known to reduce inflation. Um, But um, the problem with it is that it's, uh, it's, um, you know, reserving the support for American and Canadian companies and and European industry is uh, is very worried about it. And in response, we've seen this uh, European Union proposal, which uh, seems to be strongly inspired by France and Germany. Uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, protectionist elements. So the idea is to fight protectionism with uh, uh, with uh, protectionism. Um, and um, what, what's your idea about this? I mean, the name itself is already yeah. should ring alarm bells. It's Green Deal Industrial Plan. Yeah, yeah. More state aids and, and more uh, EU funding is not the mm. way to go here. Uh, as a Swede, Swedes, we love to trade with other countries, but we have to try to build even better things compete with other countries uh, that's the solution here the solution is not more state aid or eu funding uh, uh, and uh, we and the government are on the same page here and we're going okay. to work uh, hard uh, in the council to uh, to make uh, this proposal as little as possible eventually and we know that uh, while germany and france are on the same page a lot of small countries smaller countries in europe today don't really like this and yes. is going to be united against uh, these proposals from France and Germany. So perhaps it won't be that good, but hopefully it won't be uh, catastrophic. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because uh, it's uh, for the first time that I remember, it's 25 versus 2. Yeah. It's everybody against France and Germany. Yeah. So maybe it's a, it's a good opportunity to, to sort of uh, teach them a lesson that yeah. they can't just... Uh, come up with uh, all kinds of proposals that undermine the single yeah. market, that uh, basically destroy the, the core business of the European yeah. Union. Um, and, and um, yeah, they, they, should, they should learn that, you know, they are only 
they, they are only two out of the 27 uh, member states and, uh, and, and they, they can't be just, uh, uh, you know, coming up with this kind of uh, stuff. Yeah, you know, wouldn't de- it? yeah. definitely. And, and as we see today, 80% of all the state aid are, uh, is mm. paid for by Germany and France. And uh, they are the ones that is, uh, this is working nice for them. But as a small countries, we're really bad affected by it. So, so uh, hopefully the pri- political price will be too high, for Germany and France, to go on with it uh, without support from the rest of Europe. That's what I hope anyway. Okay. Well, I saw that uh, Commissioner Vestager, uh, she already uh, came out now against... Um, uh, watering down the state aid rules yeah. under the pretext of uh, supporting the green industry, yeah. uh, which I think is quite good because Vestager is not known for doing her job. You know, she yeah. has been, uh, uh, let's say, very slow in uh, fighting state aid and, and has been, you know, Trump called her the tax lady because yeah. uh, she wanted to use her competences to to, uh, to to stop smaller countries from offering tax breaks to to to, to multinationals. Um, uh, so maybe that's quite hopeful that in the European Commission people are starting to realize that this is about you know the soul of their own yeah. institution and and that they can't just uh, allow this to, to happen. Uh, uh, yeah, the solution is not more state aid, but of course it's problematic that we see factories moving from Europe to, to the US, and we have China that have been doing this all the mm-hmm. time. Yes, so we have to be more competitive in Europe, of course. But uh, this state aid race, it's not the way to go and we won't win it anyway. So we, sh- we shouldn't take part. Exactly. And maybe instead to come back to the first topic, focus on uh, on the energy shortage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, need, we need cheap energy in Europe <laughs> yes. to compete because, mm. I mean, I mean, the economic uh, growth in, in Europe and especially in Sweden is really depressing to look at today. Mm. And it has been quite depressive for, for some time now. We doesn't do anything about it. it uh, I mean, we will uh, lose out a lot of, in the future. Yes, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Martin Kirunen. Thank you. The Brussels Report Podcast.